So uh, today I'm going to talk about um, quantum memories in two dimensions, and uh, I promise I will try to explain what they are and why they're useful and what problem do we have even to people who have never um, seen this topic before. So the idea of a quantum memory is that we want to, we have a state, um, a qubit or like more a larger state, which is a vector in a two dimensional hyperspace. And we want to find a way to store it somewhere, keep it safe from like noise and other um, issues and free it at some later time in order to manipulate. Right? And so how, how can you do this? How do um, one can <coughs> such an operation? And so classically, we have this idea of error correcting code, right? We have one bit, it could be zero and one, and we encode it in a larger string of bits uh, in such a way that changing a few bits will not affect the um, outcome. So for example, you know, this is kind of a very simple example, the uh, repetition code, um, you could take a, a zero and encode it as a, a three times zero and one uh, to three times one. And then if you uh, want to decode it, you can do majority vote. And so what majority vote implies that if you only change one of these three bits, um, the decoding will still give you the right information you, you encoded at the beginning, right? Of course, if you change two of them, then you get uh, something called a logical error, right? The output of your decoding will be different from whatever you have encoded, right? And so this is somehow how, you know, this is a very simple and very old theory of error correcting codes for classical systems. Um, but the idea for quantum code is in a sense very similar. So what we want to do is we want to take our vector which is this vector in a two-dimensional space and uh, encode it into a, a, a subspace of a larger system, right? Like a larger um, Hilbert space. And, and in particular for you know, various reasons, what you really want to look at is um, the subspace defined as the ground state space, which means the lowest energy um, subspace of some quantum Hamiltonian. Um, and so we, if we have a, an Hamiltonian with a degenerate ground state, which has some dimension D, then we can take any vector of, of the dimension and, and basically write it out into the subspace uh, and as a way of encoding um, this vector. And so the standard, like one example here uh, is something called the toy code. And uh, I will try to introduce it and, 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 and explain some of the properties because this will be the model of a lot of things I'm going to talk about. So if you never see, if you've seen it, you're probably familiar with this. If you haven't, uh, so this is a kind of a quick uh, summary of what you need to know. So we are working on a on a on a square lattice. So lambda will be um, a, with periodic boundary conditions. So this is uh, Zn times Zn. And uh, at each edge of this lattice, we uh, think that we have some particle or some system which has. Um, uh, this can be described by a two-dimensional subspace, so um, uh, a qubit uh, situated at each of these edges. So these uh, dots in my picture, uh, I hope you can see my pointer too, right? Yes. Um, these, these gray dots in my picture represents these like simple qubits sitting in this lattice, right? And I want to define an Hamiltonian, and my Hamiltonian will be a sum of terms some of which are, are defined as a star around a, a vertex, and some of which are defined as a plaquette around uh, a center of one of these faces of this lattice. Um, and so the definition is very simple. I'm, uh, for the stars, I'm just taking a tensor product of four sigma x operations, so uh, x, 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 x. And for the plaquette, this is just the sigma z. So this is just z, 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 z. And you can check if these are commuting operations. So if you uh, try to move like the operators defined by uh, A and B are commuting. Um, and so what properties does this system has? If you look at the lowest energy subspace, the ground state space, um, you know, you can show it's a fairly easy calculation to show that um, has dimension four, the ground state space. So as, as I said before, you could, you could think of the subspace as some encoding for a four dimensional vector or for example, for two qubits, right? Which are, you know, two times two is four. So this is exactly the four dimensions. And now what happens when you try, you know, what is the equivalent of flipping one bit in our classical repetition code? There, for example, you could have some process or some noise process where um, one 
uh, qubit in your in your lattice will will get acted on by a single sigma z, like you know, like a flip in in our classical code. And so the effect of this on the ground state space. Um, so now you have to believe me that this is what happens is to create two localized excitations, which in this picture are um, described by the square um, red dots. And these are like our errors, because if you look at the energy here, you see that this is not in the lowest possible energy configuration. You have some little bit of energy here. And this is what you know people call excitations, right? Um, and, and these are called anions in the you know, physical literature, in the condensed literature. And so what happens if you now keep applying sigma z to other uh, qubits in your lattice, uh, the effect of this is to actually move this local excitation around um, while keeping the number of excitation constant. So the total energy is, is not the minimal, it's, it's, it's a bit higher, but it's always constant. And you move these things around by acting more with more and more sigma z's. And then you are notorious, so you can wrap around until you actually close the loops and these two excitation disappear. And what you obtain is a ground state, but it's an orthogonal ground state to what you started from. So we started from one state, which was the minimal energy of the system. We applied a sequence of operations and this allowed us to get to an orthogonal state. So this is somehow the quantum equivalent a setting of where you start flipping these bits in the repetition code until you reach um, the opposite encoded word, like from 0, 0, 0 to the 1, 1, 1, right? And so I want you to remember two facts about this model. Uh, the first thing is when, when you start having a lot of class, a lot of errors, they can chain up and accumulate and actually produce a logical error, right? You, you encoded one ground state, but then when you decode it, you get an orthogonal state, which is like you lost whatever you have put in at the beginning. And in order to, to do this process, we had to create some excitation, which means we had to go higher up in the energy spectrum of this model, but we didn't have to go very high up. We only had to go up to like fixed at the amount of energy. Well, you had to create two excitations and then we could um, you know, do this operation by only requiring um, a finite amount of energy. And so these are, these are the two properties we are going to see are very common into any two-dimensional quantum memory. And now, as, as I said, we want to encode some information in this model, and then we want to retrieve it after a while. And so if, if we try to retrieve it after some errors have been generated, um, what do we do, right? We measure, for example, the energy of this thing, and we realize we are not in the ground state anymore, so we cannot exactly decode it. And we have somehow project back to our um, ground state to decide which is the state we encoded uh, in the beginning, right? We have to try to correct the errors. And now the problem is, if you if you know, for example, you know, imagine you have this model, you measure it, and you realize there are two black, uh, sorry, two red uh, squares here and here, mean, meaning you have two energy um, excitations localizing which two locations. And you could say, okay, maybe this had been generated by this process where some, some external uh, noise acted on these spins and created this chain. And this is why I can find these two red squares here. And so you, you undo it and you decode it and you get some, something in the ground state. But okay, maybe that was not the only option, right? Maybe this pair of errors was generated by different process, which actually went in the other way around. And so now you have to decide between this option and this option. And okay, one of them has length four, the other one is length five. So maybe the one with length four is, is the more probable one, but we are not really sure, right? At some point we have to make, a, we, we could implement an error by trying to correct. And you know, this is exactly the repetition code. If you flip two bits, then when you try to correct it, you, you actually get to the wrong um, state, like the wrong information. And so this is what, error correction is like, you know, people study this, they try to create algorithms, they try to create, you know, uh, heuristics on, on how to implement these corrections. Um, but this is not what I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about is self-correction. And so the idea is um, how long do we need to wait before this kind of decision become tricky to make, right? Maybe if I wait 
um, you know, if, if the time that has passed is not long enough, all these errors are like actually very small and very close together. So there is no need to actually do any error correction. I can just look at the ground state closer to the state I have and that's it. And so the idea of error correction is that this lifetime of this memory can be made better and better by just taking a larger system, right? This um, square lattice as a parameter n, which is the diameter of this torus, and if we take n larger, maybe the lifetime improves. And so the idea is, okay, maybe I still have to do error correction, but maybe I can do it later or I have to do less of it. If I can make my system larger, my memory improves. This is kind of very um, useful property to have. So this is what's called uh, self-correction. And so what, what I want to discuss today is whether self-correction is actually possible to have in two dimensions or not. Um, in all of this, I, I kind of you know, mentioned that you know, there is some external process which is creating this error. Uh, I want to become a bit more um, you know, specific and a bit more rigorous. What I'm thinking of is, of course, if we are in the ground state and we are zero temperature, this is an eigenstate of Hamiltonian, nothing happens, there is no evolution. If we are not at zero temperature, then we have some you know, external bath and some coupling and something which is driving our evolution away from the ground state. And so I want to discuss briefly how do we model temperature? And so the idea is, because we are not really never at, at zero temperature, that our quantum memory will be interacting with some environment outside. And for example, you know, to make things a bit more concrete, where is some thermal bath, which has temperature one over beta. So beta is the inverse temperature and it's finite, um, meaning we have a, a non-zero temperature. And, um, and you know, very like, this is in general complicated, but you can make some assumption to like simplify your yeah, life and have um, a more effective description of your model. And, and the one I'm, I'm, I want to talk today about is the so-called weak coupling limit, um, which is basically assuming that the environment is large enough that it doesn't really evolve during this time where we're looking at our system. You can basically, forget about the environment and just have an effective evolution defined on your system. And this is just, you know, if you have some observable at time zero, then you can, you know, follow the evolution at, at a given time by solving this linear equation, which is some sort of generalization of the Heisenberg equation. Um, this is called the Louisville equation or phenomenon equation has many names. And the, the whole point is that basically evolution at some time t is described by a unital completely positive map, which you know, quantum information people like to call quantum channel. And, and so this is this semi-group. And so this L is the generator of evolution given by this thermal process. And um, again, there are like a lot of different evolutions you can define, a lot of different generators, but there is one specific one which you know, describes some more physical scenarios which people like to study. And, and this is what I'm going to talk about today are the generators which were defined by Davies in, um, you know, this 1974 paper, which is one of the landmarks of this theory of um, weak coupling limits. And if you have one of these generators, you can look at uh, what is known as the spectral gap, which is the difference between the two largest eigenvalues of this uh, object. Uh, the largest one will always be one, and the second largest in absolute value is, is the gap. And uh, this, this quantity is basically telling you how quickly this dissipation happens, how quickly you thermalize, so how strong the effect of the thermal bath is on your system. And so the inverse of this quantity is, is how, basically, by definition, what is known as the relaxation, relaxation time. It's, it's basically the time scale with which your system is, is losing whatever information you encoded at the beginning and it's driving towards this equilibrium state at, at, at some temperature. And so this is what I want to um, talk about today. Uh, this is like the spectral gap of this generator is my, um, you know, the object I want to study. And in particular, what I want to care, what I care about is how, how it scales with the parameters, with the system size and temperature. And so what, what's the idea? If you have, a gap which is constant, meaning that uh, as if, if you fix the temperature, you take larger and larger system size, it's always larger than some number, um, then um, the relaxation time is upper bounded, right? 
So the lifetime is not growing, and so we have no self-correction. And on the contrary, if your gap gets smaller and smaller, uh, when you take a larger n, maybe if you restrict to some parameter of you know, some range of temperature where this happens, um, it means that by taking the system larger, the relaxation time grows, right? And so you can make it unbounded by just taking n larger. And this is what I more or less define to be self-correction. Angela? Yes. yes. Technical issue. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please ask any question uh, if you want. So the gap is the second largest eigenvalue or the difference between the first and the second? Sorry, so it's the difference. means what? I mean, it's the difference between the largest and the second. Yes, yes, exactly. So if the gap is small, then it means that relaxation occurs slowly. If the gap is huge, it occurs fast, yes? Yes, that's correct. Because basically, the larger um, eigenvalue, it's always one, and that corresponds to the fixed point. And so the second largest is telling you how quickly uh, everything else goes to zero, right? How that's the slowest converging. That is one minus second. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. And so, in, um, so this is basically the dichotomy I want to talk about. If your gap is constant with n, you don't really have self-correction. If your gap vanishes with n, then you might have self-correction. At least, um, you know, this is how we I have defined self-correction for this talk. And the Tori code I have introduced was very quickly shown to be not self-correcting. Um, and this is a result from 2008 by Alisky, Fan, and Odoreski, Odoreski, where we show that basically there is always a lower bound uniform in n which is exponentially small in the temperature in beta, but you know, if you fix beta, that's just a constant. And you know, it doesn't matter how large n is, this gap is always fixed. Um, but there is a version of this model, which is called the four-dimensional Tori code, which I, I will not introduce because I don't want to talk about four dimension today, but you can basically generalize this model to higher dimensions. And um, it was shown to be self-correcting the sense that the gap is vanishing in n um, in four dimension. And these are the references for these results. And so you see, this is kind of annoying because we don't live in four dimensions. So it's very hard to actually implement a local lattice system in, 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 in our like physical world uh, if you want to simulate a 4D model. And so the question is, can we do self-correction in 2D? Or is, is the dimension too low and, and the, the fact that Vectoric code doesn't have it is, is, is a more general uh, feature of any 2D model, right? And many people believe this is not true. Yes, and before you continue, so if the yeah. question is what about 2D self-correction uh, models? So maybe it's good to say what about 1D, simplest possible uh, case oh. if you have on the uh, ring, yes, a circle. Uh, good, good point. I, I, um, that's, that's a very good question. I have to say, I, not, uh, I don't know exactly the details of this. Um, there are some reasons why you, you at least you have to, um, let's say we, we do believe that um, most of 1D system will thermalize very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, um, I don't have any now, now any kind of rigorous reference to give for, about this, uh, but basically classically we, we have this phenomenon that there are no phase transition in one dimensions and everything is, is very simple and something very similar happens for quantum systems. So that so, is too many for one dimensional systems that yes. will be charged, yes? Yes. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And as in 2D, there are some like, uh, you know, kind of belief that this is not possible either. And I say probably not, and this is not completely solved. And so let me try to explain where uh, the idea of why 2D self-correction is not uh, possible. And, and, and so as you recall, when we introduced the Tori code, I said one important thing to remember is that you can start from a ground state, apply a sequence of operations, which create this pair of excitations called anions, move one across the, the torus and, and fuse that back to a different ground state. And this whole operation only has required us to go 
only to a first level of excited energy. We didn't have to go to an energy which scales with n, right? We didn't have to go very high up in the spectrum. We kind of stayed at the lowest possible outside of the ground state. Uh, this feature uh, is called basically having an energy barrier. And this is very generic in 2D. So there is a basically almost, you know, not almost, but like uh, any 2D model which has commuting interactions and, and has this property called frustration freeness uh, has this property. So it's not specific to the Tori code, it's not specific to the kind of models I'm looking today. It's, it's a very kind of um, widespread effect. But you can always go from one ground state to an orthogonal one by only applying polynomially many operations uh, and only going up a constant uh, level of energy. Right. And so if you think about this, when you can say, okay, maybe this is the problem with the Tori code, right? You know, my external thermal bath will create these anions. Uh, why one, once these anions are created, there, there is no energy cost in moving them around. So they will move around the torus and, and kind of break my, my model. And so this was kind of a uh, intuition behind why people said, oh, you know, to the error correction, to this correction is not possible. But there was uh, a paper in 2014, which made this interesting observation that basically said, the fact that you have one path between ground states, it doesn't mean that that path is easy to find. So you might have some entropic effect. And, and now let, I will explain it in this next slide what I mean by this. But basically makes this process very atypical and, and therefore kind of hard to find. And so the idea is, again, think of, of this kind of model where you create particles and particles move around. There might be, you know, your thermal process doesn't really know which is sequence of operation that it has to apply. The thermal process is kind of trying, uh, you know, things at random. And so maybe it tries, you know, these are like kind of, if you want different instances of the same noise process where it's trying to do things at random. And sometimes it actually finds the right path of operation which brings to a logical error, but most of the time it will not. And so while in the like worst case, the lifetime is very short, maybe on average is not so bad. And, and, and now this is not just the existence of one path, it's, it's more like a question of like, uh, you know, there is some like, you know, entropy versus kind of probability to, to, to figure this out. And so the fact that you don't have this high energy barrier doesn't necessarily mean you don't have self-correction. And so what I'm trying to argue is that I really want to go back to the kind of definition of this and or I really want to study the spectral gap <coughs> to be sure that this is not what's going on when I'm, this is what's going on. And, and I'm not satisfied with just this result of looking at um, energy barriers between ground states, okay? And so basically, this is the result uh, we obtained recently. We look at a very kind of large class of quantum memories, which were introduced by Kitev in 97, which are called the quantum double models. And the Tori code I, 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 I described is one specific example of this class. So if you want, it's a generalization of the Tori code. And each of these models is defined starting from a group, from a finite group G. And so the model de depends on the group. And what we can show is basically for any of these models, you always have a lower bound of the gap, which is constant with N. Uh, this lower bound depends obviously on the group you choose. It depends on the temperature, just like the Tori code, it goes to zero very quickly when temperature goes to um, infinity. Uh, and you have this G mean, which actually depends on somehow which kind of environment you had. So as I said, you can always write it out as a, as, a, um, as Davis generators, but you know, this is kind of um, some reminiscent of what particular coupling, what particular physical model you had. Um, but none of this depends on N. Um, what, what was this known before? Only partially, like people knew that this was true for the case where G is abelian. So if you want the new result that this is still true when BG is non-abelian, and I will explain in a second why the non-abelian case is particularly interesting. Um, but we also have a very different approach from this paper from 2016. We don't extend the result, but we basically go back to the original proof for the Tori code of Aliski, Fanin, and, and Odorreski, and we re 
work it using something called tensor networks in order to apply it to these larger class of models. And so what I want to do with the rest of my, of my talk, I kind of give you a little bit of more you know, intuition and details about how this, um, you know, um, how this uh, works. It's a good time to ask questions if you have any. Any questions? So uh, the, the yeah. implication is that the, the semi group of or, or of these Davis generators, or what's what's the group? Of, what's G standing for? Sorry, can, can can you? I heard it, but partially. Yeah, group G. What is it standing for? Is it like the, um, uh, the sort of the generators for this uh, for this uh, Lagrangian evolution, or is it related to the stabilizer? No, no, G is related to the stabilizer, right? For now, I will introduce the model, but like for the Tori code, the G is uh, the groups of two element. Is that true? Um, and has nothing to do with the Davis generator and the semi-group I mentioned about. That's always like a one parameter semi-group. So that's basically always, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's R as a semi-group, but it has nothing to do with this G. This G it's related to the kind of operations on the stabilizers. Uh, and can I also ask about this bound? So this is lower bound, but is it saturated or? Uh, a very good question. Uh, I don't know. We didn't try too hard to optimize this. Um, it is trying to understand. So this maybe I, I misunderstood something before. So in order to head cell correction, the gap has to be very large or very small. Sorry, it's not it like very small. Very small. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because very small means very slow convergence to the thermal state, and so it means that you can stay closer to your initial state longer. I see. So this bound, so it doesn't matter whether it's optimal or not. If it's if it's lower bound with a constant, then it means that there is no cell correction. Okay. Yes, at least at least on a qualitative level, right? Then you could ask, of course, how you know how you know if you maybe wanted a, a bound on the lifetime of a memory, which is like a, a practically useful bound, right? Maybe you want to sharpen it, right? Um, but as, as long the fact that this is strictly positive for any n and you know uniformly in n is is the important uh, part of his result okay, thank you I, I also have another question on the gap like you would have thought like oh if the gap is big and i have an encoded state then the environment cannot easily disturb it out of the ground state right but this is not the gap of the model this is the gap of basically the environment acting on your system so this is oh. if you want the strength of the action of the environment on your system. And the fact that it's constant, it means that if you take a larger system size, the effect of the noise doesn't vanish. If uh, it doesn't get smaller, it's always equally strong. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll continue. Um, I will now try to define these quantum double models more you know, explicitly. Uh, so maybe this uh, clarifies the role of G in, in, in this construction. And uh, this is really a generalization of a Tori code. So uh, you know, if, if you want to follow this, try to think of a Tori code uh, as a model. Uh, again, we are on the square lattice with periodic boundary condition, but now we need to fix one orientation of all the edges. I will use the one depicted here. It doesn't matter if you choose a different one, you get another, a different model, but it's equivalent. So it's just a matter of choosing one and sticking with it. And in the Tori code, we added on each edge a Hilbert space of dimension two. And now what I want to do is take my discrete, uh, my finite group and, and, and basically um, create a Hilbert space with the basis of elements of a group. And so this is the definition of basically the group algebra of G, if you know what it is. Otherwise, this is just, uh, you know, take the group elements as a basis, as an orthonormal basis from Hilbert space. So dimension of this Hilbert space is the order of a group. And um, as before, we put one of this, a copy of this Hilbert space on each edge. And this is just notation, we'll call B sub um, E, the bounded operators acting on this Hilbert space. 
And the Hamiltonian of this quantum delta nodal has the same shape of a one Noetori code, is also sum of star terms acting at a center a V and plaquette terms acting at you know, a face. And, uh, and these are also commuting. Um, so I just need to basically tell you how these are defined. I just need to define this A and B. Um, to do so, I need to introduce a little bit of notation, the regular representations. So in, on, on this Hilbert space, L2 of G, there are like there are two natural uh, actions of the group, meaning we have two natural representations. We can define some operators indexed by G, uh, the left and right representations, which basically shift the group basis, the basis elements by uh, G, either on the left or on the right. And this minus one here, just to make sure this is actually uh, a representation of the group. And uh, you can check a few things. These are unitary operators. Um, because one acts on the left and one acts on the right, uh, they are commuting. And, uh, and the, again, example with the Tori code, if your group is um, uh, Z2, the group of two elements, then these uh, two uh, operators are um, the same for the non identity and uh, is uh, the sigma x, right? This sigma x is what is shifting zero to one, right? So this is what uh, these uh, operations are doing. And then uh, a little bit of notation because we have these two options uh, to use either the left or the right. I want to make basically make this option um, depending on whether I'm, I'm like at a vertex V and I look at one edge, uh, if edge is going out, I'm going to choose the left, and if edge is coming in, I'm going to choose the right. And again, this choice is basically arbitrary, but I need to make one, one choice. And so these are the interactions now. So these are the formulas, uh, but maybe it's easier to look at the pictures. And so in, in, in the Tori code, the star operator was uh, sigma x, sigma x, sigma x, sigma x. And now I have this average over all the possible group elements and I choose either the left or the right representation, depending on which, um, you know, where I am. And, and so the orientation now is with, this is left and the left, and this is right and right. And the plaquette terms are similar. You take an average, but now you look at all pairs of um, group elements, sorry, or quadruplets of group elements such that this product vanishes. And when you look at the rank one projection on that group, uh, element. So this is a this is diagonal in the so if you want in the basis of this Hilbert space. And so if you want, this is some generalization of sigma z operators, right? Which is again like something defined in terms of zero zero plus one one. And it's clear that the b commute with the b's because they are all diagonal in the same basis, and the a's commute with the a's because when you overlap two stars, one will have a left and one will have a right. And as I said, these two operations commute. So this, these two effects are easy to check. Uh, the third one requires a little bit of work, but it's a simple algebraic manipulation. So you write uh, you know, A times B, and you check that it's actually equal to B times A. And so you can show this is a set of commuting interactions. Um, and so there are some facts which, you, know, you don't really need to remember the details, but just the very basic fact is that uh, the ground state of this model uh, is fixed, doesn't depend on n, like the Tori code was four. Uh, in this case, you have some uh, formula, which is this you know, number of something called flat G connections, but you know, really this doesn't matter. It's just a number and this is the dimension of the ground state. So if you give me a group, I can tell you what the ground state is. So this is the dimension of my code, right? How much, how many dimensions I can encode in the ground state. Um, elementary excitations are again localized as particles. So when you act on a single side, you will create a pair or more than one, more than two, but like, you know, you create some local object. Uh, and these are related to something called the quantum double of the group algebra, the Greenfield's quantum double. So this is where the name of the model comes from. Um, but again, this is not really from, you know, just the important thing is that these are localized. And if you have a group which is non-abelian, when, when you start braiding and exchanging these excitations, you can create non-abelian operations. And this is required in order to do 
what is known uh, universal quantum computation. So if you want to create a model where you're actually uh, computing on these uh, quantum memories by just creating a citation, braiding, and fusing them again, you need non-abelian groups. So this is this model of computation on as topological quantum computer. And so the fact that we are able to study the non-abelian case is interesting because if you only have abelian groups, you cannot do universal quantum computation. The kind of uh, circuits you can implement is restricted. If you want to do an arbitrary circuits on this model, you need to be able to have uh, some non-abelian group. So this is the quantum memory we look at. And now I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, noise model, like the thermal process. And these are these so-called Davis generators. Um, and, and so I, as I mentioned in the beginning, we are basically describing some effective evolution of this noise. We are not describing the noise, uh, like the thermal bath itself. We're only describing the effect that this thermal bath has on our system. And this is given by the semi-group of uh, unitally completely positive maps. And L is the generator of this, um, of this semi-group. And you know, the evolution of observable is given by this uh, linear equation. And because this um, exponential of T of L uh, has to have these properties of being unital or being completely positive, L cannot be any arbitrary linear operator it has to be of a specific kind. And this is known as the GKLS form from the name of you know, these four people. And the form that this, uh, this, this uh, generator hell has to have uh, is of this kind. Uh, you can have some commutator, commutator with some emission operator, like in the standard Heisenberg picture, you would only have this part, and this would be a unitary group. But now the new part is this dissipative part, and you have this basically cross the composition of um, your L with these jump operators Li, and then this factor which basically makes it unitary. Unital. So these L sub i are the so called jump operators. So if you want to think of this jump operator as some non emission operator, which is basically mapping you from one energy level to a different energy level, right? This is the non unital part of this process. And in our specific case, this Davis generator have this specific form. And so this is this big formula. And now we're trying to explain the little bits of it. So the generator is it's written as a sum of terms, each of which is indexed by one of the edges. And uh, each of this uh, L sub B is by itself uh, in the JKLS form and can be further decomposed um, as a sum over alpha and omega. And this D, D uh, big D is basically a single jump term, a single dissipative term with these jump operators. And so let me explain all these parts now. I, need, I have been introducing this formula. A lot, lot of notation. I apologize, but I'm trying to make it more concrete now. So omega are what's called Bohr frequencies. So these are differences in energy levels of your uh, quantum double Hamiltonians. So these are possible transitions between one energy level and a different energy level, right? Depending on your spectrum, you can have certain transitions. Um, these jump operators S alpha omega are the Fourier components of a basis of bounded operators on a single edge uh, with respect to evolution generated by H lambda. So this is basically the formula. You look at the Heisenberg evolution of this operator and you write out as a sum over frequencies. And so you realize that this omega are exactly the ones you need to be able to write this, this formula. Uh, this g hat alpha omega are just some positive constants, and these depend on uh, basically the correlation of the environment. So this is where the uh, basically the choice of which kind of thermal bath you had is actually visible, right? Not not every thermal process gives rise to the same generator, but basically they all have the same shape except from having different g's. So this is the only thing which really depends on some of the physics, if you want. And and this g mean hat, I, I you know. I presented in the main result is just the minimal of these positive num uh, numbers, which will turn out to be, uh, you know, it's not clear that, you know, this sum is actually final. So this, this is really a positive, um, strictly positive uh, numbers. These are actually um, non zero. And so if you, this is. And so yeah. this 
Omega is, uh, is um, indexing the differences in the energy of the Bohr spectrum, and alpha is what the generosis somehow. No, I, alpha alpha is just the fact that you have um, like you uh, this um, the local Hilbert space has some dimension, and you want to be able to basically have as many coupling as the dimension of it. Oh, I see. So alpha is like the different couplings you could have. And that similar problem, the property of Davis generator is that its spectrum is real, or how is it? Yes, yes. I, I'm going to I'm going to explain it in the next slide. But that's a very good observation. Yes. So um, this is a very special kind of generator. Has some nice properties. Um, and again, this is not every thermal evolution. This is, uh, you know, under some assumptions of the environment, which I'm not making explicit here, but I, I'm basically taking this as my starting problem, right? Studying this model. Um, and so if we have the thermal bath at some inverse temperature, uh, one over beta, and this would have been finite, sorry, not positive, but um, not all, so this generator has, a property called detail balance. And detail balance is defined in terms of the scalar product over operator or matrices, which is weighted by the Gibbs state. So rho beta is the Gibbs state of the quantum double Hamiltonian. And this is a um, scalar product that is the Hilbert Schmidt scalar product by weighted by rho. And you can check with this, uh, this is a, an actual uh, self. Um, positive scalar product, right? So this is a well-defined scalar product on the space of operators. And, and L will turn out to be self-adjoint with respect to the scalar product. And, and minus L will actually turn out to be positive. So the fact that it's self-adjoint exactly means that the spectrum is real, uh, but it's not self-adjoint with respect to the standard Hilbert Schmidt scalar product. So you, you, the fact that the spectrum is real, we can see it because we can find a different scalar product in which it's self-adjoint. And, uh, and the spectrum is actually positive, like is negative. And so the spectrum of L is only zero and negative reals. And so minus L is a positive operator. And um, some other properties which are not so surprising this deep state is the unique invariant state. And uh, the process is primitive in the sense that if I start my evolution at some state sigma and I look at the expectation value of some operator Q after time T, in the long time um, limit, I get the expectation values under the uh, Gibbs state. And so this is independent of initial state and uh, observable. And sorry, and for those operators, uh, you also study spectral gap. So the size of the second largest uh, eigenvalue, which is real, yes? Yes, right. So I, this now this minus L, because the spectrum is real, the spectral gap is really, uh, there is no absolute value defined like there. It's really just the difference between one or like, sorry, in this case, uh, it's zero and, and then uh, largest, sorry, the smallest non-zero is, is the difference between the two. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, one other extra property I wanted to mention about this Davy generator is locality. So because our Davy, eh, sorry, our quantum double Hamiltonian H lambda is a commuting Hamiltonian. Um, then this generator is, is a sum of local terms. And so by this, I mean that I said, I label these generators, uh, I wrote L as a sum of, of L sub E, where E is labeling one edge. And you can show that each of these um, generator is only acting on a few sides around this edge. So if E is the red mark edge, L sub E is only affecting this region of your space. And now we're summing over all the possible ones. And the other implication of this is that we only really care now about the spectrum of uh, the Hamiltonian in this neighborhood. And so omega is actually not all the possible uh, difference between energies of H lambda, but only the ones of this restricted H. Uh, which is basically between minus four and plus four, because um, these are all the energies differences in this region. So the generator is, a, is has, has has these properties: is 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 self-adjoint uh, with respect to a different scalar product. It's it's negative in the sense that minus L is a semi is positive operator and is is local. This sound like the list of properties 
uh, um, an Hamiltonian should have, or a Hamiltonian has, right? And so, we, we, in fact, we can write this generator in, as, as an Hamiltonian on some vectorized inverse space. So what I want to do now is take this L is a generator acting on operators, and I want to write the space of operator as a doubled uh, uh, Hilbert space. And you know, let's take this tensor product of two copies of my Hilbert space, and this is um, you know, isomorphic to B of lambda, but I want to make a choice of the scalar product, which is very special. And so the identification of an operator with a vector will go to um, you know, defining omega a maximally entangled state. This is just a sum over a basis of my Hilbert space and taking the two copies. And then I will act with Q on only the left side of this omega uh, maximally entangled state, but I will first pre-multiply Q by one half of the Gibbs state. The reason of making this weird choice of identification of operators with vector, that this actually gives me an isometry between the space of bounded operators with this GNS scalar product and this doubled hyperspace with the natural scalar product coming from the tensor product. So this is what I call vectorization. And um, because of that, I can basically now define some um, L tilde E acting on this vectorized space by just basic, basically vectorizing the action of L sub E. Right, so this is the definition. And I can define some H tilde as minus the sum of all of this uh, AL tilde. So this kind of is vectorized equivalent of minus L, minus the Davis generator. Um, and because of all the properties I explained, uh, self-adjointness, positivity, and locality, this turns out to be an actual frustration-free um, Hamiltonian. Um, but it's not, I mean, these are, this is not a commuting Hamiltonian anymore. This is a non-commuting um, interaction term. And, and this is local, but the support has grown a little bit more because of this vectorization, but it's only grown again by basically one step further. Now it's the ball of radius two around the site. So this is like a kind of a fairly big um, interaction, but it's still finite range. And so it, you know, I will just call this uh, L tilde and be happy about uh, the fact that the support got a bit bigger. Um, sorry? Uh, yeah, it's on. Yes. Uh, yeah. Could you please remind us what means frustration free? Oh, First, yeah. Like 10 more minutes, okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, time is, I'm very good with time. So frustration free means that um, you have a ground state, which is a common ground state of all these operations. So the lowest energy of this H tilde will be zero. And uh, you actually have a, a kernel in, in H tilde. It means you actually have some state which is simultaneously uh, in the kernel of all this L tilde E. So there is no, uh, this is one, there's no frustration in the ground state. There is no reason for this uh, L, is all this L tilde E can agree that something is the ground state and everything has uh, energy zero. Uh, in that in that case, okay, thank you. So this vectorized Limbladian, we can really um, study very concretely. We can look at not just you know the ground state of this H tilde, but we can look at what people call the local ground state. Uh, and by this, I mean you take a region X, you only look at the interactions which are inside X and you look at the ground state of that restricted Hamiltonian. So things which are only have zero energy in that region. They might not be ground state everywhere else, but at least in X, they look like a ground state. And we can basically completely characterize this local ground states by saying that these have to be the image through the isomorphism of some operator which is only acting outside of X. And so it's the identity inside X. So this, these are all the local ground states of this model. If you want to have something which is, is vanishing all of the interactions L tilde on X, he has to be of his form. And then if you take X to be everything, there is no X complement. And so there is only one unique ground state of H tilde, which is the image through this um, isometry of identity 
And uh, if you go back to the definition, you see if you put Q equal V identity, this is rho beta one half tensor identity on cat. This is a purification of the Gibbs state in the sense that if you trace out half uh, of, of this doubled space, you get exactly the Gibbs state. So this is a pure state for which the Gibbs state is a reduced density matrix. And people in the literature like to call this the thermophile double. It's like a fancy name for this object. Um, but if you want, this is the, the vectorization. Of it. And so basically what I did by this vectorization process was to construct some frustration Hamiltonian H tilde, which has a purification of the Gibbs state as unique ground state, and because everything was true in isometry, the gap of H tilde is exactly the gap of L. And so what I need to study now is the gap of H tilde. I have, I have not really done anything. I just changed basically uh, my uh, setting, but I just translated the problem to a different word, but the problem is, is still, still there, right? I just change a little bit notation if you want. And so this is somehow the problem with attack using tensor networks. And I'm, I'm going to be very brief because I don't have time. And this will be you know, another like hour lecture if we ever wanted to define all these things. But this vectorized Gibbs state, uh, rho beta one half, uh, we can show it's, it's a tensor network state called a PEPS. It's a 2D tensor network. And uh, PEPS is uh, an acronym from projected entangled pair state. But basically, we can write a very um, special representation for the state in terms of a contraction of tensors over a, a lattice. And every PEPS, or like every PEPS with some property, um, you can associate it naturally uh, an Hamiltonian called the parent Hamiltonian, which is also a frustration free Hamiltonian. And this is constructed out of the tensor representation of this tensor state. Our H tilde. Because H tilde is a frustration for Hamiltonian and has a PEPS as a ground state, you might say, oh, maybe it is the parent Hamiltonian of that PEPS. Uh, it is not. And so we actually have to work a little bit to compare these two things. So now we have the same state, which would, we have the same ground state in two different Hamiltonians. Luckily, we can compare them. And actually, basically, the big part of our bound comes from this comparison problem. Like we can lower bound this H tilde by this H parent by paying this price, which is half of our bound for the gap. And, and, and in particular, you know, the gap of L is the gap of H tilde, which is lower bounded by this constant times the gap of H bound. And so now the problem is all in the fields of tensor network states. We have a parent Hamiltonian and a PEPS, and we want to study the gap of this. And so this is a problem that, you know, people in tensor network have, have worked a lot on, and we have developed tools to do this. And basically, we have some cases in which we can answer this question, not always, but we can basically check that the PEPS has some condition. And from that condition, um, derive, you know, conclude that the parent Hamiltonian will have a gap. And so we do all these calculations. They are not easy, but it, 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 can, be, it can be done. And we can actually show that the gap of this parent Hamiltonian is lower bounded by something which only depends on the group we chose to start from, and it's, it's strictly positive, no matter what n and beta is. You put all this together, and this is how we, we get our words. OK. So if you have, you know, if you're interested more in this part, I'm happy to kind of um, you know, answer a question later, or like, you know, we can, we can chat and, and we can. Um, I can explain it. But so this is basically concludes my presentations. Um, this is what we showed that for any 2D quantum double model, the gap of a Davy generator is always strictly positive. And, and this is some scaling we have. Um, and, and as I explained, I interpret this positivity of the gap as a absence of self correction, even in the case of non abelian groups, which was the interesting case in order to be able to do topological quantum computing. Now, this doesn't cover any 2D model. So maybe my title of this talk was a bit lying. I am not sure whether there are like no good memories in 2D, but we are trying to study other topological models in 2D, uh, for example, the so-called string nets, if you heard of that. And many of these models can be described in very similar way than these quantum double models by generalizing them further, replacing this group 
algebra by something called the Hopf algebra. And so these things, this makes things a lot more complicated. Uh, and we're trying to see if this is possible and if the proof techniques uh, go through. Uh, let's say part of it, the part of the presented today on the vectorization of Davis generator is mostly um, the same. The question is whether the PEPS has the right property to, to have a gap. So we are trying to study the PEPS representation of these Hopf algebra models. And what also we like to do in the future is, is actually check the mixing time. So as I said, this is all about the gap, but I would really like to see how quickly you get to the fixed point and or to this thermal state. If you have a spectral gap, you get a bound. This bound is still polynomial in the system size. We, we believe that a stronger bound of the mixing time should hold. And this stronger bound comes from some other inequality called the log Sobolev inequality. So the, another constant, which is not the spectral gap, is the log Sobolev constant. And we believe, we're not sure, but we, we should be able to prove that this stronger condition actually holds, which means this process is really thermalizing extremely fast. Um, and this is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Yes. So thank you very much. Very nice talk and perfect. You are perfect in time. Let us start the discussion. So first remark is very simple. You mentioned that if you can prove that the uh, gap is uh, positive, there is no self-correction. Yes. Yes. But if the gap is zero, does it imply self-correction or not yet? Well, I mean, if you sh let's say, first of all, you know. Here we are finding lower bounds, right? So if we want to show that something, if the gap is small, you have to start working on an upper bound, right? The, all these techniques give you lower bounds and obviously a vanishing lower bounds is not really uh, telling you anything, right? Yeah. Um, if you have- um, Upper bound. If you have, if you have an upper bound which is vanishing, um, uh, I would say, I'm not 100% sure whether that's really true that you always have sec correction, but um, you, it's, it's, not, it's not completely clear in the sense that it, 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 there is something which takes a long time to thermalize, but that something might not be uh, the one which gives you good memory. So, you know, the fact that you, see, you still have to, you still have to check that the memory has a good properties in a sense. Okay, uh, I mean, other questions? Yes, uh, Felix. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, what happens like with this approach if you go to four, uh, like high dimensional models? Like does this PEPS approach not work anymore or? Uh... So, ha, good. It, it's um, the construct, the, this vectorization I, I explained, it, it, it's, it works exactly the same way in a dimension. What's very different is our knowledge of like our technology toolbox for showing gaps. And so the results I, 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 we use here are very specific to 2D PEPs. So you can define higher dimension tensor network, you can define parent Hamiltonians, you can try to study them in the same way. Uh, this is not a very well explored world because basically 2D is already so complicated that um, in 3D you can have uh, fairly more complicated things. Uh, but it's also like a very, you know, it's, it's, it's also like on the list of interesting problems to, to go to. Um, but some of the issue there is that the technology for tensor network in 3D is, is less um, powerful or at least less developed. Yes, either. Yeah, so I guess my question is similar. You said that um, in 4D you can have uh, error correction, and in 2D it's expected you cannot in general. Mm -hmm. But yes. I, I guess I, I live in 3D, so it's the expectation that I can or cannot do error correction in 3D. Yeah, that's a fair question. I, I, have, I think there is no general result. So no. it could be some self-correction in 3D. Um, I think we know some model where um, the gap vanishes. So you might expect that you have self-correction, but vanishes very slowly, like logarithmically or something like, uh, like inverse logarithmically. Um, and so if you want, that's a very, you know, it's a middle ground, like you might be able to get uh, some improvements by making larger memories, but the improvement will be less and less. And, and at some point it's not clear if that is practically useful or not. 
uh, I, I think there, is, there are some examples, like concrete models where this is done. Um, whether you can actually have like exponentially kind of, you know, you double the memory size, you double memory time, that's still not clear at all. Yes, thank you. Other questions? I have a question. Yes, ah, good. Hello, Pablo. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, thank you for the talk. So about this three dimensions, um, Hector Bombin has introduced this uh, color codes, which are subsystem codes. Right. And and then he he claimed that uh, you can have single shot memory that he connected with um, with um, with um, self correction. So so my question would be if your uh, if this model quantum double models if they allow for description of subsystem codes. Um, I, I I think I think not, but this is not uh, exactly the same. These are like the standard kind of topological codes. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, probably something that one should look at after this, in a sense, that how subsystem codes arise. But yeah, this is that that subsystem code is a different um, um, setting, if you. Will. Um, I, I not an expert, but I also think that subsystem code by themselves are, require a little bit of action in the sense that you have to switch between you know the the, the gauges and the subsystem, right? Yes, so I, I mean you can. Exactly uh, you, we, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so so you can you can be fixed for one specific gauge, but then you are allowed only to do some specific sets of gates transversely. If you if you just want to have a memory and you do not want to do any operations, then you can be fixed all the time. Okay, because I'm saying this because you need to somehow define some like thermal process, which is just, you know, independent of whether, whether you're like changing the gauge or here mm -hmm. we are not actually trying to measure the errors and, and correct them while this thermalization process is happening. This is just okay. you know, leaving the memory alone and, and checking it later. And the, the second question, if, if I can, so in the general generalizations that you would consider later, you would still be restricted to this rectangular lattice? Um, we, we are because basically this um, uh, Hopf algebra quantum double are defined, in, well, you can define in more general terms, uh, but um, uh, I, I have to say, I, I suspected most of this uh, goes through if you generalize to different geometries. So we, we define it on the square lattice because it's more, it's more like natural or if you want a simpler one. Um, but I don't see uh, anything deeply, um, you know, there might be surprises, but it would be, it would be very weird. I think, I think if you do this on, on even like some irregular graph, as long as you have like, you know, bounded degrees and these kind of properties, um, most of this should go through very, very easily. Um, the, the PEPS property we have, we show is not related to having a square lattice or not. And mm -hmm. the calculation we do, it, it's very, it has, it's explicit. So, we, you know, we choose a square lattice in order to make it easier. Um, but it, 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 it's, it, it, it seems that it's strong enough that it should um, hold if you perturb the square lattice and, you know, remove some legs or add some legs and change it a little bit. It should not matter too much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Pavel, thanks for being with us for your questions and for reminding us that we have a contact with outside world. Yes, company <laughs> with outside world. It's not a closed system. Are there any more questions from the distant audience? Mm -hmm. If not, so uh, Angelo, maybe a simpler, very last uh, simple question from me. If you take your simple torus as square, what changes if you replace qubits by, let's say, qubits? If you have a lattice of qubits, does it change anything? Well, if you want, these quantum doubles are exactly trying to do that, right? If you uh, replace qubits with qubits, uh, you how you you know what's a sigma x, right? You have to define some some other operations, right? And so you could think of sigma x as uh, cycling through the yes. tree base. Yes, and, control and, or something, yes. Right, and so and so you could define some, you know, sigma z, which has some like faces, which are like a square root of, uh, you know, third square root, sorry, cube root of identity and things like that. And you basically get the z3 model. So these are, if you want, uh, classes of models. 
with like higher uh, dimension than a qubit. Okay, thank you very much, Angela. Thanks for being with us. Let's thank the speaker again.